Welcome to the session on protocols. The first talk is on quantum proofs of knowledge and will be presented by Dominique Unruh. Please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, my topic is quantum proofs of knowledge and quantum proofs of knowledge are related to, of course, zero knowledge proofs. So let me first say a few words of motivation why it would be interesting to consider zero knowledge, uh, quantum zero knowledge proofs in the first place. So most of you will probably agree that considering zero knowledge is an interesting thing. It's um, a central tool in crypto. And uh, not only that, many things that appear in crypto can be studied in a like, small example on cryptography, all these things like rewinding, concurrency. All the problems pop up there first, and then you get them in more complex settings like multi-party computation. And then the other thing, why quantum? Um, well, more precisely, what we are doing here is post-quantum crypto, meaning we consider classical protocols, so some zero-knowledge protocol, like for graph isomorphism that everyone knows, uh, but we ask, is it secure against adversaries with quantum computers? Why is this important? Well, first thing, if at some point physicists manage to build a quantum computer, then we would like um, cryptography to be ready for it, and on the other side, if we build a protocol, if we want to build future protocols that make use of quantum cryptography, we also need the classical building blocks in that to be secure against quantum computers. So let's jump into the topic uh, and have a look at how, um, how we deal in the classical setting with the zero knowledge property. So how do we um, prove that a given protocol is zero knowledge? Uh, we have to, given only a malicious verifier, Simulate the whole interaction with the prover, but we don't have access to the prover. This will then imply uh, the zero knowledge property. And this is usually done as follows. So we will only consider sigma protocols where we have three messages from the prover to the verifier commitment. He answers with a challenge and then gets a response. And what the simulator does is he first, or in many situations does, he first guesses the challenge. Uh, then if he knows what the challenge will be, uh, he can construct the commitment so that everything will go through. And then if he guessed right, everything works, he produces a good transcript. If it doesn't, he just goes back, tries again, and repeats until he guessed the challenge right and this goes through. This works well if the challenge space has only polynomial size, like for example, only two challenges. However, in the quantum case, uh, this approach is much, is, um, much more tricky. Why? Why doesn't this work? Well, the thing is, this error here is not well defined um, in a quantum mechanical setting. Because what this precisely means is, at this point, you copy the state of the verifier, and if you reach this point, you restore the state to the copy you made. But quantum states cannot be copied. That's one of the laws of quantum mechanics. So we cannot do that, and we need an alternative solution. Uh, this solution was proposed in 2006, or 2009 in the journal version, by John Watrous, and the basic idea is, instead of making a copy and going back to that copy, we, uh, since we can't do that, we have to undo the computation that we made so far. So this is basically uh, the algorithm that Watrous uh, suggests to um, make a simulator for a zero knowledge proof. You take some simulator that kind of tries and may either say it worked or it doesn't, so it's like, one try, he guesses the challenge. If it works, goes through. Otherwise, says, no, please try again. And then you run it. You measure whether it worked. So it will have an output bit. I'm succeeded or not. You measure that. If it works, uh, you're done. If not, you apply the inverse of the simulator. That's a nice thing in quantum mechanics. Uh, any operation that is uh, so-called unitary has an inverse. So you can apply the inverse computation of what the simulator just did. And hopefully, you are then back in this original state. There are a lot of subtleties here which imply that you need to do some additional stuff. But that can all be solved, and you can find it in Watcher's paper. Um, what you can achieve with this technique is what I call oblivious rewinding. If the simulator says, I want to rewind to the beginning, that works. He goes back to the beginning, but he forgets everything he has learned because we removed, re rewind the whole state of the simulator. Uh, no problem in typical zero knowledge simulations because he just wants to try again. He doesn't need to remember that he's trying again, but this will be important later. 
So does what result, uh, result solve the problem of uh, quantum zero knowledge? Well, it covers a lot of um, existing um, zero knowledge protocols and can show the zero knowledge property in the quantum case of these. Uh, there are some exceptions, but that's not the topic of this um, talk. But there's one big limitation. If we don't want just zero knowledge proofs, but zero knowledge proofs of knowledge, then Watrous technique does not work. And this is what I will show you in this talk. And I will show you in this talk how we can actually get proofs of knowledge with a different technique. So let's recapitulate very quickly what we want from a proof of knowledge. Intuitively, we want to prove not only that the, um, a certain mathematical fact is true, but that we know something. Example application, we want to prove our age to some vendor. We have a set of certificate issued from the state, and we want to prove that we know a government signature on a document that says that we are at least 18 years old. Uh, we don't want to reveal this document directly because um, we might be ashamed of our actual age or don't want to tell everyone or something like that. Uh, so this is why we need proofs of knowledge that allow to express this fact that we know a certain thing, in this case a signature. And uh, the definition of proofs of knowledge very roughly is the following. Um, we want that if the prover is successful, so if the prover success in convincing the verifier, in this case, we want that a certain machine, the extractor, can, given only the state of the prover, compute the witness. Or in this, ex in this example here, if the prover succeeds, we could extract from the prover the signature of its age. And this is, in most situations, sufficient to prove all the things um, we want to do when using these proofs of knowledge in bigger protocols. So let's see how this property is usually proven, again in the classical case. So we are given a prover, and this prover uh, outputs the first message called commitment, gets a challenge, and answers with a response. But we want to now not only see these messages here, but extract the witness. And a typical technique is the following. We run an interaction with the prover where the simulator just sends the messages that would usually come from the verifier. And then when we reach the end, we go back, we rewind to the point just after getting the commitment from the prover. And then we send him another challenge and get another response. Um, and now, Many uh, such sigma protocols, three message zero knowledge protocols, have the following property called special soundness. This one means that if you have two different respo um, two, dif uh, two responses to different challenges, as we get in this case, then from these two responses, we can compute efficiently a witness. So if, for example, in the relatively well-known graph isomorphism uh, protocol, uh, you would get um, the commitment would be a graph J, and you would one response would be an isomorphism to G, and the other to a graph H. And from this, we can compute an isomorphism between G and H, which is what we were interested in uh, in the first place. So what happens if we try to do the same in the quantum case? Oops. Uh, there, it doesn't work again. Because as I said before, rewinding means copying. So in this case, we would have to, sto we have to store the state here, do this interaction, then go back. Uh, and going back means taking the copy we made earlier and continue. Not possible with quantum mechanics. What about uh, the rewinding by virtues? We have seen that there we can do rewinding, we can go back. But as I said earlier, Wattrus needs the, uh, does oblivious rewinding. So if we rewind, we forget everything we have learned so far. So if we do this here, the extractor would rewind he could do the second execution with the second challenge, but he would forget the re first response. Because quantum mechanics, you can't just store this response, because by storing this response, you uh, inhibit the going back. So you have undoing the whole computation means also undoing the learning of the response. Sounds paradoxical, uh, is quantum. So, um, so we need to find some way around this. We need to we will try to get, do the same kind of interaction. However, we want to do it in a way 
uh, that is compatible with the laws of quantum mechanics. And for this, we use the same idea again as in the Rogers case, namely that we apply the inverse of the simulator. But we cannot use the proof of Rogers, we cannot use the precise construction of Rogers because it doesn't apply here. So let's try completely naively to take the extractor we have seen just now, the rewinding one, and replace the rewinding by an inverse of the simulator. So this is what I call the canonical extractor, and has the following steps. So first, we run the prover, so the first step of the prover, and we measure the commitment. So here, we run the prover, and then we do a measurement that gives us the commitment. First step of the prover. Then we continue running the prover with input challenge one. And then we measure response one. Here, input, prover with challenge one, measure response one. Now, we, we have the challenge one, response one, and we want now to give him challenge two res and get response two, so we need to rewind. For this, we just do the inverse operation of what the prover does. So the prover does something on challenge one, we do the inverse. This can be efficiently applied, and this, at least intuitively, would bring us back here. And finally, we now run the prover on challenge two and get response two. And hopefully, if we are in the state that we were here, this is just a normal interaction. Prover, get the commitment, give him challenge two, give, get response two. So we might hope that this will actually give us um, two responses to two different challenges. Um, does this work? Unfortunately not. Because if we measure response one here, then a second particularity of quantum mechanics comes into play. Namely, whenever you measure something, so you have a state and you want to measure some information about this state of the system, this will in almost any ca all cases change the system. So if you, if you have something which is in a superposition between zero and one, and you measure whether it is one, then you will get your answer, but afterwards it will not be in a superposition anymore. We have the same problem, because if we measure the response here, um, we change the state, so it will be not this state after here, so this one will not be the same as this one, and then this rewinding here fails, because applying the inverse of the um, prover here uh, assumed that we had the state that we just got out of the prover. So this and then this would work, but this, then this, then this doesn't work. It's simple to construct examples where the canonical extractor fails. So what can we do? Let's make a thought experiment first. Let's assume the response that we get got here, response one, or both responses actually, are not long bit strings as they would usually be in zero knowledge, but actually just one bit messages. This doesn't really make sense because there are no zero, uh, sensible protocols that have one bit responses, just a thought experiment. Then we have that by measuring the response, we measure only a single bit. And the less you measure, the less you disturb. So if you do the math here, which I won't, then you will find out that measuring the response one disturbs the state only in some moderate amount. And then you do all the calculations and find out this amount is moderate enough that the whole extractor works with a sufficiently good probability. Uh, and therefore, extraction would work in this setting if we would have a protocol which has a one-bit response, which we don't. So the idea now is not to assume that we have a one-bit response, but to try, try to make sure that the length of the response is effectively one bit. So it's not truly one bit, but it should be kind of in an information theoretical sense be equivalent to being a one-bit response. And that can actually be achieved by adding an additional condition on the zero-knowledge protocol. This condition I call strict soundness, and it says that um, for any challenge that you send uh, to the prover, there's at most one possible answer that would convince the verifier. There can be none if the prover made a mess. It can be very hard to find the, uh, this, but we have the guarantee that there cannot be two different answers the prover can give. This is what I call strict soundness. And now, um, this makes the response effectively one bit, because it's either the one correct response or something which makes us abort. And which thing of the things that makes us abort doesn't really matter, because we abort anyway. Um, 
so this is really as if we would measure only a one-bit uh, response. So measuring uh, the response that is unique if it is valid is equivalent to measuring one bit. Um, and if we do go through the math again, we will see this actually works. As soon as we have the strict soundness property, the canonical extractors shown here on the side will work and it will um, successfully extract a witness with a certain sufficiently big probability. And you may wonder what this probability is. So, if, so this is the main result of the paper. If we have special soundness, which was the property that given two responses you can extract the witness, and you have strict soundness, meaning there is at most one correct answer, then the probability of that the extractor extracts successfully is at least the probability that the verifier is um, convinced minus one over the square root of the number of challenges to the three. And if you're familiar with proofs of knowledge, you will see that this is similar to the classical case, except that there you will have the number two here, uh, and the square root will not be there. But essentially this, except a bit for efficiency, doesn't hurt us very much. So um, if you have strict soundness, you get, as clo uh, you get quite close to what you can do in the classical case. And um, we can now actually construct um, quantum proofs of knowledge, which using Watrous work are also um, zero knowledge. However, there's one remaining problem. How do we get strict soundness? Well, for example, the well-known graph isomorphism proof does not have strict soundness because there could be several different isomorphisms between the same graphs unless the graphs have a property called rigidity. So the graph isomorphism proof does not fall into this framework. We can't prove it. Um, the, disc the typical discrete logarithm proof has this property. However, it is rather boring in the quantum setting because in the quantum setting we can just compute the discrete logarithm anyway. Uh, I don't know any natural candidate actually be, uh, that is not boring, but we can make a trick to achieve strict soundness given an existing protocol. We just add a commitment in the, com uh, in the first message to every response that we might give. This only works if we have a polynomial number of challenges, of course. Um, and then we will not have the choice to open to a different message. Um, this addition needs a property called strict binding on the commitment, which makes sure that we also don't have different possible unveil informations, because otherwise this would introduce new um, choices for the verifier. Uh, although I think I've, a few days ago I had an idea how to get rid of this, but this is not in this talk. Um, if we plug things together, so if we take, for example, proof system for Hamiltonian cycles, we take commitments that we can build from injective one-way functions. Uh, then we have the theorem that assuming injective uh, quantum one-way functions, quantum zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge exist for all languages in NP. Um, this is pretty nice, uh, besides one caveat, which uh, is still there. We currently don't have any candidates for um, quantum secure injective one-way functions, so please find some. Uh, but I have ideas um, how to get to lower these um, conditions. I'd be happy to talk about this offline if someone is interested. So future work, um, generalizations, like considering the computational setting, this was only in the proof settings, not for arguments. Uh, things that are not sigma protocols but have more messages. I think these are pretty simple, but I haven't done them. Then, in the future, we will have a look also at other rewinding techniques. So for example, two follow-up papers um, had different approaches to um, solving um, proofs of knowledge, um, where they rewind not the actual extractor, but in the coin toss. And I guess there are many more other rewinding techniques out there. And then, of course, we would like candidates for injective one way functions. This is not only needed for my work, but also Virtuous prior results also assumes them and doesn't have them. So, with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions? Not there? Uh, now, to, to get 
if, if you want a quantum bit commitment scheme that has strict... Sorry, can you say again? Yeah. Uh, it, to get strict binding yes. for in a quantum bit commitment scheme, then it cannot be hiding. Um, and you cannot have both binding and, and, and hiding. Yeah. Well, it will not be information. If it's, uh, inform if it's strict binding, uh, then it cannot be information theoretically right. hiding, but it can be hiding. So if you take, for example, the construction that you take an injective one-way function, and with random input, that's your commitment, and the bit you commit to is the hardcore bit of this one, of this function. This has strict binding because there's only one inverse, and it is statistically hiding. This is why uh, in this theorem here, well, it's statistically uh, hiding this or quantum ZK means computational zero knowledge, you, not statistical you, zero knowledge. You just said it's strict binding, but statistical uh, strict binding and statistical hiding, or computational? Uh, strict um, strict binding. Computation okay, yeah. statistical. You could right. also, yeah. I guess, I haven't done this, weaken the strict binding property to something where that, like collision resistance, you can't find two. Uh, but I haven't gone through that. I don't know whether it works out or not. Thank but you. that's a conjecture I have. Any other questions? Okay, thank you once again.